Welcome to Jews on Film. My name is Harry Adensasser. I am one of your eponymous Jews on Film. And joining me as always is Daniel Zana. Hey everyone, my name is Daniel Zana. I am a video editor, documentary filmmaker, and I have a really nice brown hat for you, Harry. Remind me after we record the podcast. Please. Okay. I'm really excited to welcome our guest today. She is the Jewish Foundation of Cincinnati Chair in Judaic Studies at the University of Cincinnati. Uh, she's also the author of Funny, You Don't Look Funny, Judaism and Humor from the Silent Generation to Millennials, and is currently at work on a new book about Jewish identity in comic books. Dr. Jennifer Kaplan, welcome to Jews on Film. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, and we're... I'm waiting for my brown hat. <laughs> it's in the mail, okay, I promise. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, You just have to go down to... um, What, seat, did, what street were they, like, telling... Where did where were the 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 hats sold? Oh, where the hat salesman was? I don't remember exactly what street it was on, but yeah, go down and get the five dollar Stetson. That's it. Yeah, um, we're really excited yeah. to have you on today to discuss the 1988 film Crossing Delancey, directed by Joan Micklin Silver. Um, you know, before we get too too deep into the pickle barrel, I wanted to kind of ask you what made you uh, pick this movie to talk about on Jews on Film. Um. That's a great question. Is so, you know, we had a sort of back and forth over email thinking about different movies that we could discuss. And I had just finished the semester um, and I was teaching my Jewish humor class this last semester. And, uh, and this is, it's one of the films that I do. And it's one of the films that I do kind of in the latter part of the semester. So I, I had just watched it a couple of months earlier and I was struck by not necessarily the fact that none of my students had seen it before that wasn't surprising but I was struck by how many of them fell completely in love with it they one of them was like weeping openly as we watched the movie and then at the end of the semester there were multiple students who said it was their favorite thing that they watched all semester long and a it's it's a great movie and you know i i love it too and i'm excited to talk about it but it wasn't necessarily something that i thought was going to be so it, that it was going to speak to 20 year olds um in the way that it uh, apparently did and so I, that really made me think that the movie has legs more than i uh, kind of realized and and so i thought it might be it might be worth talking about it might be something that that actually has a has a whole nother life um, as new generations discover it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. For, yeah, for sure. I will count myself as someone who definitely had not seen it. I was vaguely familiar with the name. When you suggested it, it sounded familiar, but wasn't as, uh, didn't know as much about the movie until I watched it. And I was really, really struck by it. And it gave me this kind of overwhelming sense of, you know, they don't make them like they used to anymore. Because yeah. there was something delightfully simple and almost low key about the actual drama or the plot of it all. Like, if you have to sum it up, and we will when we give our summaries, but it was kind of, you know, this woman meets or is introduced to this nice Jewish boy, decides she wants something a little more, and then kind of settles for, okay, I'll go on a date with this guy. And that's kind of it in terms of the stakes. Of course, yep. there's a lot of rich themes, and I'm excited to get into it, but it was almost refreshing that there weren't any, like, intense, dramatic, you know, uh, like, you know, twists and turns. And obviously, we have a little bit of that tension kind of come to a head towards the end of the movie. We'll discuss when she's, you know, with the other person and she's mm. kind of coming back and forth. But right. even then, it was a movie that really just, it let this woman work through her feelings with this and kind of figure out what she wanted at a very, you know, I thought like, you know, nice pace. And yeah. I don't know, it was, it was kind of refreshing. I feel like I haven't seen a movie like that in a long time. It also felt like very timeless in a sense that like some of the stuff was very dated to the time of New York City, of the, of the, you know, uh, craziness that is New York City at night and like the, the, but it also seemed like it could happen today and just be a little bit different with more like shiny buildings on the Lower East Side and things like that. But yeah, yeah, overall, there's still Jewish bubbies living on the Lower East Side in the co ops right. on Grand Street. And so, like, some things change, but a lot of it stays the same. I wanted to also ask, you know, you mentioned a few modern films in your books from the, you know, Coen Brothers and Kissing Jessica Stein no. and things like that. Um, so where does this film sort of fit in in terms of its like Jewish humor and its depiction of like stereotypes? Yeah, that's a really good question. I, I think it really 
it's almost like the film equivalent of a mood ring. Like it's a different genre of film depending on what mood you're in when you go into it. Like I think of it as a rom-com. Yeah. Um, and one of my students was like, no, this is a drama. Um, and when I just rewatched it the other day and I pulled it up on, uh, on Amazon Prime, they have it classified as a drama. Uh, they have it as like drama, romance, something else but whatever the third thing was it it wasn't comedy um so it it's it's interesting that that the film doesn't even really strike a lot of people as comedy whereas i think it's very funny um you know i i think it has a lot of very very dry humor it definitely would fit into the category of boomer humor um in the way that i set it a uh, early boomer humor i guess boomer humor that looks like silent generation humor um because the way that i sort of identify that in the book is humor that sort of doesn't have much place for um organized religion ritual um but is nevertheless in that post holocaust way very protective of the idea of jewish peoplehood and and jews in general um and for all that Sam is depicted as this, you know, relatively observant guy, when he describes his day, he goes to shul every morning and, you know, says, goes and, you know, has services before he gets to work by 10. Um, there's no indication at the end of the film, you know, we get the indication at the end of the film that they're going to make a go of it and, and they're going to get together, but we don't get an indication that that's going to involve Izzy. There's no, like, rapprochement between her and judaism there there's right. no sense that she's gonna start going to shul so i i don't think that one of the underlying messages is that we are reclaiming ritual mm -hmm. um which is what i identify in um late boomer and millennial humor um or in uh, late boomer and gen x humor so so yeah i think in terms of the the schema that i have in the book it, it definitely is exactly what it would be for the late 1980s which is something written by a boomer um that still looks like silent generation humor yeah i, I think I, I was also really interested in what you were saying about kind of where this is genreified you know how people look at this movie because i think what the movie does really well is it's very sympathetic to Izzy and never I felt forces her hand either way. It never judges her for, you know, leaving Sam standing or kind of pushes her towards him or either away from him. And it's the kind of thing where I can imagine, depending on where you're coming from to watching the movie, where you are in life, how you feel about, you know, this decision, you could read it in different ways. And, and like you said, I think the movie doesn't end with this, you know, big statement on either their relationship it's not saying okay they're getting married obviously Bubby kind of teases that a little right. bit but you get the sense like yeah he'll, he'll come over the next time I come you know there's not it's not too deterministic and I think what you're saying is like yeah I'm sure there are conversations they're going to have to have about you know their faith and their relationship and what that would look like and those will come when they come and they'll yeah. kind of figure it out but the movie is really like it's non-judgmental of kind of this relationship and just tells them to you know just go for it see what happens that's kind of the, the end note there and I think it judges her a little bit by the end, like at the very end where Sam's waiting for her and she goes with Anton yeah. anyway. My yes. my husband yeah. wasn't even watching the movie with me a couple of days ago when I rewatched it, um, but he had been walking back and forth through the room at various points. And at the point where she goes over to Anton's apartment instead of going to see Sam, he was walking behind me and she was, he goes, and oh my God, she's going with the jerk? <laughs> I was like, okay, even somebody who's not really watching the movie yep. has picked up on the fact that Anton is kind of the worst and she is making the yep. wrong choice here. So and, I, and I the think movie, there's a little yeah. bit of judgment there at the end. Yeah. And I'll, I'll give you that because I think the movie, you know, when we find out that really he was just trying to kind of poach her over to work for him, like they give him that like signature evil turn that's like just yeah. hateful enough that right. it's okay, now we can fully get behind. So right. there is a little bit of that pushing, but... Yeah. I think until that point, I was like, you know, maybe she doesn't want to go for the, you know, the nice Jewish boy. But yeah, I yeah. know we'll get into all that. Before we get too far, let's do our very in-depth one sentence IMDb summary, which gives us, like you said, Harry, it's a very simple plot, if I may, you know, uh, or you want to go ahead and do it? Yeah, I'm happy to do it. But it's, I was it. about to agree with you. It's exactly what I expected. Because yeah. that's really like, I don't even feel like it's lacking. I'll read it now. We've been teasing it, but it just reads. Here we go. A Manhattan single meets a man through her Jewish grandmother's matchmaker. That's it? That's yeah. it. That's how. 
That's how IMDb talks about the film. I would say it's not inaccurate. I mean, yeah, perfect, there... perfect synopsis. No notes. Yeah, no, <laughs> yes, exactly. I mean, there's so many layers to this film. There's so much we want to get into. Maybe before we take a break, I I did you know as we're talking about characterizing the film and things like that. One thing that you know occurred to me is that like most of our main characters, with the exception of of Sam, are like you know wise female characters. We have Bubby, we have the matchmaker, we have Izzy. Um, I, I don't know. It's it's it feels like um, and and the fact that like Izzy has a lot of agency and that she's able to like choose her destiny kind of. You know, it feels like a pretty feminist film for the time. I don't know if I'm maybe reading, uh, you know, misreading it or whatever. But in terms of like modern romantic comedies, I often feel like fate is being decided for them. Whereas like Izzy has these two paths available to her and she's able to kind of chart her own course and, and kind of, uh, you know, create her own future. Yeah. So uh, any thoughts on that? If not, we can take a quick break and come back. No, I, I agree with you. Okay. No notes. All right. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, we'll take a quick break. We'll come right back and we'll kind of like dive into the film a little bit more. And maybe we'll do a, a quick visit to the context corner. Um, so we'll we'll take a quick break and we'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back to Jews on Film. We are here with Dr. Jennifer Kaplan to discuss Crossing Delancey. Before we kind of get into some of the the topics and themes, you know, depicted in the film, I just wanted to take a quick stop to the context corner over here and talk about the film. Like I said, came out in 1988, directed by Joan Micklin Silver, who had previously uh, directed a another film just around the corner called Hester Street. I think that was 1975, another Lower East Side, uh, you know, classic. Um, it was written by Suzanne Sandler and also based on her play, uh, starring Amy Irving as Izzy Grossman. Peter Reigert as Sam Posner. And then we have like a, a lovely sort of secondary cast of, of me very memorable characters. We have Rizal uh, Boisic as Bubby Cantor, uh, Yaron Crabb as uh, Anton Mays, Sylvia Miles as Hana the Matchmaker, uh, David Hyde Pierce in one of his early roles as one of the co-workers named Mark, and then uh, John Bedford Lloyd as Nick. Um, so yeah, filmed all around the Lower East Side, uh, I, I spoke to someone, Jason, who grew up, he was a friend of mine who grew up on the Lower East Side and he remembers it being filmed, you know, around when he was uh, 17 or 18 years old because he, like the characters in our film, had family that grew up in the co-ops, those big sort of brick buildings depicted in the film and kind of remembers it being filmed there. But yeah, Harry, you want to kick it off? Yeah, sure. So I wanted to get us talking, you know, obviously this is Jews on film, but this admittedly was a very Jewish movie. I think that was, you know, it was honestly Jewish rom-com. I would put it safely, you know, squarely in that genre. Yeah. And, uh, you know, one of the reads that I got, and, you know, this is a commonly used, you know, term trope is this idea of the nice Jewish boy, which has been used to describe, you know, that the kind of affable Jewish character, very sweet, you know, and often is contrasted with, I think, the, the edgier, maybe a little more of the bad boy. And, you know, in this case, I think a real mysterious other. So, I wanted to hear your thoughts on if that kind of, if you were watching this movie, you know, and obviously, you know, you, you teach about this course, so I want to see, you know, if you have any thoughts on that, but, you know, the way that this movie kind of pits Izzy's paths according to this, you know, I think the central dichotomy of, you know, the nice Jewish boy versus, you know, this more mysterious kind of up in your future and, you know, how that kind of stages her, you know, growth throughout the movie where she's really trying to figure out, you know, what she's actually looking for in her life. But I wanted to hear if you had any thoughts about that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I do actually. Um, so awesome. it's one of the reasons I find this film so compelling because yes, Sam is the nice Jewish boy or not boy because he's older, um, sure. but you know, nice Jewish gentleman um, contrasted to Anton Mays, who's the sort of, you know, artsy cosmopolitan European playboy, whatever. But what's so interesting about Sam, we see him embodying a lot of the kind of negative nebbish stereotypes so he'll either be seen as like physically weak whereas we see sam playing handball um and being athletic or we'll see him being like um henpecked but sam owns his own business so like all of the the kind of emasculating weaker characteristics that tend to come up with the nice jewish boy like sam defies those and in fact we we get some indications that he's not even 
quite as like not that he's not nice but that that there's an edge to him that doesn't even necessarily come across on the first viewing it it was it it was on some subsequent viewing of the film that i realized for the first time there's there's this scene um you know izzy has this sort of uh on again off again side piece who she is in fact his side piece um so right. you know we, we found yeah. out early on there's this kind of like sexual liberation stuff going on where right. she's you know sleeping with this married guy um whatever and so there's this scene towards the end where he his wife has thrown him out and he comes over to Izzy's apartment um and sam is there and he's like well you know where am i gonna stay and sam says um you know you can you can stay with us tonight it's just me and my brother um and he's like yeah okay great and izzy says well that was a very nice thing to do and sam says not really and the way he says not really it it was like the third or fourth time i watched the movie that i finally recognized that he wasn't doing it to be nice he was doing it because he didn't want izzy to sleep with nick oh and, okay and that didn't it, it didn't click to me the first couple of times it's oh you know sam's this nice guy he's doing this altruistic thing this guy doesn't have a place to stay so he's offering a place to stay and it it was it was peter Rieger's brilliant line read on not really that i finally recognized like oh he just doesn't want izzy having sex with this guy because he's finally making some progress with izzy so he's attempting to keep his lane clear um so like yes he's a nice guy but he's not he's not passive and he's right. not he's not um he's not a sort of jokey kind of character like he's he is a strong dude who knows what he wants um and is gonna do what he needs to do to try to get what he wants which in this case is is yeah i mean he's an absolute like catch like perfect 10 for me i'm saying like yeah. The dude works around pickles, but then he like puts lavender and vanilla all over his hands. No, vanilla and milk. Vanilla and milk right. to make his hands like smell nice. But like Anne goes to services and he plays pickleball and he cleans Bubby's windows. But like you're saying, like he does like in the later scenes when, you know, he's at Bubby's house and then Izzy comes over and, you know, uh, Bubby has set up this sort of like... Uh, this meeting again and yeah. as he's like getting in the elevator he just like lets the the win the door close like he he comes back at her for like all the things she's saying like how to deal with things and he's like oh now i'm a problem to deal with like all this kind of stuff he gets a little edgier and a little bit more frustrated as the film uh comes you know goes through and and he's asserting himself quite a bit more um but yeah still perfect perfect catch i'm saying like yeah anybody would be would be lucky to have him. So yeah. Oh, first, Daniel, you you said uh, I think you misspoke. You said that he played pickleball, but he's a pickler who played handball. But it's ah, possible yeah. that it's yeah. possible when people came up with that sport, they were watching this movie and they <laughs> put that together: pickle, handball. So I I think Very you're good. onto something. Yeah. Um, like second of all, I really agree. I, I think his character has a lot of backbone. And if we're saying he's no longer a nice Jewish boy, he's become a nice Jewish man. It's possible that he's, you know, been dating for a little bit. He's, he seems like the kind of guy that's been set up and he's developed a little bit more of a, you know, kind of forceful backbone with everything. I think the other interesting point that I wanted to mention is, you know, you're saying he's not kind of that typical nebbish, almost, you know, you didn't say this, but almost bookish stereotype that mm -hmm. we associate with, right. uh, with the nice Jewish or, you know, a Jewish character like that. And what's interesting is that's kind of where Anton fits in because mm -hmm. he's the one who's, you know, the author. He's the bookish one. He wants to read. And, of course, the movie kind of flips that and it, it seems like he's clearly more interested or maybe not entirely, but he's somewhat interested in the feedback he gets to wooing some of the crowd when he's writing his words than he, he is about being engrossed in the book. But, you know, we have that scene where Sam is invited into the, you know, the bookstore and he rejects it. He's like, I'm not going to sit here. Like, this is not. And it's a really interesting, you know, reframing. It's like, and if the movie is pushing us towards Sam, which I believe it is, it's taking this character that's been not only associated with his, you know, soft, sweet, nice Jewishness, but also with kind of this bookishness and saying, he's actually, he's a tough, capable Jew. And, you know, I wanted to try to transition this into, you know, one of the things that Daniel and I spoke about earlier is that this movie, you know, his kind of uh, relationship, it's, it's in some ways pitting, you know, a little bit more of a traditional background. And we see that in Sam, both in his faith, but also in, you know, his do taking on the family business and the pickles versus, you know, something that's more progressive. And it kind of feels like by taking him and moving him away from the bookishness and saying he's a person who gets things done, is in the world and ultimately, you know, ends up with Izzy, at least at the end of the film. I think there's something interesting going on about, you know, the way that tradition, 
you know, Jewish tradition specifically, it can kind of exist and continue. It's almost like the bookstore in the beginning, like. The printed word has survived. New Day books have survived. Yeah. Yeah. We are here. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks to all of your creative effort, New York's last real bookstore will be around for a good long time to come. And uh, I want to hear if anyone had any thoughts just about the way that this movie deals. And you mentioned it earlier, Jenny, just about uh, like that this movie is not advocating for full faith, but it, but it's also not dismissing it. So I wanted to hear how you think the movie kind of comes out on that on that question. Um, I'm not sure on that one. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, certainly the 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 tension that you highlight between and and it is so interesting to think about the fact that this movie is 35 years old right and the bookstore was already celebrating still being alive it's uh -huh. like, oh, right. God, I was thinking you know, the, the more things change the more things stay the same um so you know some of these conversations we've we obviously been been actually having for decades um but but yeah the the sort of tension between the little independent bookstore that's trying to maintain its existence and the family owned pickle store um although we don't actually we don't get any sort of sense that the the pickle shop is um is threatened or imperiled right at all there's there's no uh there's no sense that his business is um is on any kind of shaky ground it's really just the <laughs> bookstore that that seems to be kind of on thin ice um but I, you know, I, I don't necessarily know between the two businesses. I don't know if we're necessarily supposed to kind of like feel one way or another or, or see a sort of, um, a sort of tension there. I do think, I do want to go back to what you said though, the, the interesting scene where the one scene where Sam does come into the book reading, which um, I, I was hoping we would mention the scene because when you were listing the cast, you you didn't mention the very odd and surprising cameo by Rosemary Harris, who you know shows up in this one yeah. in this one scene to play this amazingly pretentious poet, um, and uh, you know, and, and Sam. One of the things I like about that scene is um you know is he is like do you recognize anybody here and he's like oh yeah um and and he mentions that he had to memorize one of her poems in school um so like he 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 is well read you know he he knows who she is he recognizes her by sight he knows her work he memorized her work and he still then gets up to go stretch his legs because he doesn't want to literally sit at her feet because they are they are literally on the floor. He doesn't want to sit at her feet and be worshipful of her brilliance. Um, and I there there are there's just like so many little subtle things in that scene that give us an indication that it isn't that Sam doesn't know this stuff and it's not that he's not well read. He just has other things he wants to do rather than sit there and be worshipful of these writers. Um, so I just I, I really like some of the subtle, some of the subtle directing choices in that scene. It's uh, it's very interesting how they talk about like Sam and Anton in terms of like Harry. We're talking about like you know uh, being progressive versus being a little bit more traditional and things like that. And you know Sam, they they sort of put in this sort of traditional camp, but like in terms of his roles at home or at Bubby's home or his attitude towards women, it's like fairly progressive compared to like Anton, who's like clearly like misogynistic and is like using women uh, both for his assistant needs and for his own, you know, sexual needs and things like that. And so it's kind of like a flip in that, in that regard where like, I, I honestly, you know, I don't know what Izzy sees in Anton other than like the fact that he's a, a suave, stuck up, suave, stuck up author. Like I'm, I'm team Sam or all the way. I don't know if that's already apparent, but like, you know, he's so nice to Bubby and you know so good overall to women and yeah it's uh but it's kind of a flip of what you would traditionally see because you think that like anton who's this like cultured person would be more sort of open and and polite and progressive um towards women treat them more as equals but he's totally you know you were talking about rosemary harris's ca uh cameo he totally like goes toe to toe with her yeah and they're talking about stuff and um you know he's not sitting at her, her feet and meanwhile getting uh, you know, Sam's getting kicked in the face, literally, right. by Anton when he's sitting down. So he's had enough, like you said. 
And and in in Anton's defense, in the scene where he goes toe to toe with Rosemary Harris, she's being horrible to him. Yeah. So like it, it, he that's the one scene where I think he is he's sympathetic we root for him. Right. Um, but yeah, no, I mean the very first time we see him in like the opening scene of the movie, we see him gesturing to Izzy from across the room, and they give it the kind of like soft lighting, and she's like. Oh, he wants to talk to me, and you right. know, we Whoops. there no words have been exchanged, but we know that like she's into him, and he's drawing her over, and it's just so that he can give her his empty champagne cup Ugh. for right. her to like clean up for him. So yeah, like right from the jump, we see his kind of regressive gender politics, and then at the end in his in his last scene where she realizes that he just wants her to be his new assistant slash bed warmer. Right. Um, and and she gets up to leave. The he says it's more than just secretarial because that it, to him that's the only objection she could possibly have right, to right. this arrangement is that she thinks that it's a secretarial position. So yeah, he's he he is really the more regressive of the two. I'm still you know, Team Sam. Just go ahead, hundred percent for the right. record. Yeah. For the record, let her but yeah, he, he certainly views the relationship very transactionally, and right. I think that that first scene is a really good point. That it kind of you know, as she's walking over, it's like, here, you take this from me, then we can talk. And it's always, you know, he's always gaming the next thing. And I think what's interesting about you know where we're talking about Sam because I agree with this whole thing. Of course, he embodies a lot of the traditionalism of his faith and his you know work, etc. But I actually think, like we've been arguing, he's a very progressive character, and he's the only one who thinks kind of more forward and more to the future. And ultimately, that's kind of what he represents in some ways, you know, where Anton might be this present love affair. In some ways, Sam, I mean, he's being set up for the purpose of marriage. You know, this is, right. and we haven't used this word yet, but this is clearly like a shidduch that's being set up, right? This relationship that's being set up by uh, Hannah, I think is the character who kind of pulls it all together. Uh -huh. And I think where we meet Izzy, it's clear that this is, you know, not quite, in some ways, settling down would be going with Sam and moving towards the future and thinking towards, you know, continuing. And it that was kind of what I like what I tracked for her, which is she wasn't necessarily ready for that in the beginning. And she was almost willing to give it a try, you know, come to the end of the movie. But to me, that represents a lot more of this progression forward and this, you know, what can the future hold as opposed to I'm enjoying my cosmopolitan life, you know, kind of flirting around, sleeping with different people, you know, living in this bookstore. And I don't want to think about the future. Just yeah. yeah. And and I think that that's actually one of the interesting things about the movie as a as an artifact of its time. If the movie had been made, well, either if the movie had been made in the twenty first century, um, we would have a scene at the beginning of Act Three where they have a big fight over their incompatible lifestyles, where we would have the conversation about you know, well, you just want me to give up my job and move to the Lower East Side. And well, you just want me to give up my tradition and move uptown and be a nihilist. And, you yeah. know, and then they would come together at the end. And if the movie were made in the early 2000s, she would probably find a bookstore on the Lower East Side and she would move down to him. And if the movie were made today, he would probably move uptown because feminism. But like we would have that we would have that scene of them having the absolutely expected fight about tradition versus modernity and, and how are they going to reconcile these two things? And I think that it's great that the film doesn't do that. I also think it's a little bit of a cop out that the film doesn't do that only because that is a legitimately big conversation that they need to have at some point if they're going to have a real relationship. And they, so they do sort of deprive us as an audience of, a real hope that the couple is going to make it because right. we we don't know how they're going to figure yeah. that out but they don't resort to that trope yeah are you uh are you familiar with the film keeping the faith that came out <laughs> i think around 2000 god stab me in my eye but yes i am familiar <laughs> oh, with that okay film. okay so we we covered that in the past on the podcast and i think what you kind of just described is what that movie yes. hits you with head on and honestly there's a lot of parallels it's the same kind of love triangle it's a little bit different you know who she's sure. kind of you know reaching out to but that's uh, a movie uh, you know there's this this new adam brody show uh -huh. that everybody's so excited about you know adam brody what is, is a hot rabbi um, but to me it's, right. it's just it's just sure. keeping the faith too it's it sounds like it's gonna be this you know cute rabbi who runs across a manic pixie dream goyle and <laughs> goyle. i love it 
I coined that the other day, by the way. Great. Um, and, and you know, and runs runs off after her, and I'm just I'm so tired of I'm so tired right. of that Ben Stiller. The whole like first 15 years of his film career was making movies to a try lot. to explain to his parents why he married Christine Taylor, and <laughs> and I I can't <laughs> really I can't with it. I would I I really love that read, and I think that movie, which we we discussed previously on the podcast, I think it it really does raise those issues in a way that like. I didn't expect from, you know, yeah. and I guess with the context, but I didn't expect that from a kind of major, you know, studio film. It, but I think when it comes to resolving it, it, it tries to remember that it's a rom-com and, co- and goes with, uh, you know, we'll figure it out. We'll I think see, exactly. Having those yeah. legitimate questions. And this movie, because it doesn't even flirt with those ideas, because it kind of hints that those will come up, but it leaves you not at this is their wedding or this is them six month dating, but at the will go on a real date. I mean, at, up to that point, they haven't really gone on a date yet other than yeah. the one where, you know, she tried to set up her friend with him. So right. obviously, you know, not quite a real date. I agree with you. It raises a lot of questions. I think in the doc, Daniel, you put something like, you know, where are they in 20 years or something? Right. And I, exactly. I think we could ask that question, but I don't know. I think in six months, they are, are dating depending on how those first couple of months go, how they're, you know, whether or not they're willing to have those conversations. And I just don't know if we know enough about Izzy's faith and her background. You know, we know about her Bubby and her family and where she comes from. But, Uh you know, I don't don't know. I don't know where those conversations go. But I think the movie definitely leaves you with there are a lot of questions. And it's not afraid to say this isn't happily ever after. This is just the beginning of a relationship. Yeah. I think we deserve a sequel in 2023. Amy Amy Irving, Peter Iger, let's get back together. If you're listening. I want to see what's going on with them. Like I put, you know, like, are they living in Florida? Do they have grandkids or do they have kids? Are they still on the Lower East Side in the, you know, selling pickles? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, pickles are all the rage now. So I think think they've done like with like a very, you know, like uh, whatever you call that, like a like boutique kind of pickle brand, like a very modern. Gentrifying Delancey. Gentrified thing. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's certainly plausible. I think, you know, uh, selling at the Whole Foods market and, you know, Sam's cashed out because he sold his brand to like. A larger corporation, so like now twelve dollars for one pickle. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I think it's it's interesting because, you know, where does Izzy's career go as she's you know she's working at the bookstore? Does she then open up her own bookstore? Does she like what are her aspirations beyond? Does she want to write her own book? I think that Amazon didn't somebody say something like that uh, that Izzy should be writing down what her bubby said into some kind of book. Am I making that up? There was well, some Sam talk. has. Yeah, Sam like, has a book. That notebook. Yeah. Right. So and maybe he says, that... I write down. Yeah. Right. Go ahead. Yeah, he, he just pulls out the book and we can honestly clip it in. But he says, you know, I write down, mm-hmm. you know, I bring this book with me all the time because I write down when people say things that are worth writing down. You know, you should do that with your Bubby, who I want to talk about her for a minute because I thought she sure. was. And of course, and we're going to get into this because we have our categories coming up with the most Jewish scenes of the film. And certainly, you know, she is present, I think, in all of them. But I thought that was a really interesting depiction of, you know, unafraid to be Jewish, you know, and again, I don't know the context who was watching this, but this is a very Jewish character. She's talking about, you know, setting up people on dates and shit us with her friend Hannah, who has, you know, the full accent. I mean, it's, it's verging on like the, the caricature of what you think of with kind of the, the overbearing Jewish Bubby, but like, you know, very supportive, very interesting. What did you guys think of the, uh, of the Bubby character in this film? I mean, she was great. I think, it, you know, the, the specifics are like what sort of, rang true to me like like we talk about like in our last episode we talked about specifics being universal and i think everyone has a grandma who has sort of unique traits but like this idea that she's like opening up the cabinet and there's just like a closet full of like recycling bags like plastic bags and um yeah. you know sending leftovers home with her um always like pushtes like always like 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 uh adding in the yiddish into the into the stuff and and just being sort of this like compass for Izzy of like her Jewish connection, but also laying on a thick amount of guilt. I I love that character. And I think, you know, she added so much because, you know, as great as Sam is, you know, like the, the Jewish connection really comes from Bubby. And so like having her kind of be along the ride is almost like a, a third character in this, in this main in film, you know, this triangle, I think, you know, it was great. I loved it. So. Yeah, I agree. I, you know, she's, she's such a great character. And, and I love that the film kind of right off the bat gives you two different ways of being an old Jew. Um, because <laughs> we, we meet her character. And then when they meet Fana for the first time, you know, and Fana's saying, like, what does she do for a living? Where does she lives? She lived by her parents. And, and Bubby says, you know, no, her parents live down in Florida. 
right. all the social security checks under one roof. Um, so, you know, right. we have the like old Jews who have moved to Florida trope versus mm -hmm. the old Jews who have stayed in the old neighborhood. And Rizal Boisek, like it needs to be mentioned that this is the only English language film she ever did. She was a star of the Yiddish theater. Um, and I love this movie for a lot of reasons, but if I love this movie for no other reason, then it's because it gave us a, a lasting artifact of her as a performer. Mm -hmm. um, it's sort of the same reason why I love the prologue to A Serious Man, because ah, it, yeah. it will forever give us Five Ish Finkel in his original metier. Um, and and so I love and you can you can see it in her like her facial expressions are overdone. You can see the stage actor in her. But I think it works so well for this character that, like, you don't even, it doesn't really feel theatrical. It just feels like who she is as a person. Um, and I, I absolutely, I love her character so much. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can confirm, you know, my relationship with my own Bubby. Like, that, that wasn't overperformed. That's the kind of, you know, over the top <laughs> showering with love. Even, even the questions about, you know, marriage and who you're looking at, like, that all rings very true. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, it's it's interesting that, like, she's sort of different than the rest of the Bubbies on the Lower East Side because there's that one scene, you know, in the in the elderly self-defense class where, like, you know, they're they're simulating scenes of, of attack, you know, fighting off their attackers. And, yeah, she just, you know, she seems to have her wits about her a little bit more than a lot of the other older people on the... And, and like, in addition to just, like, cognitively where she's at, she has, like, this incredible like moral compass and kind of knows to, to sometimes she knows like just when to push enough and like when to stop um uh, i think she kind of like fine tunes that skill like later on in the podcast or later on in the film <laughs> as she's you know and maybe un after a few shots of schnapps but right i wanted to jump back to izzy for a second if that's okay because we were talking before you know about izzy being this like modern woman and the first mention of Sam, you know, like Izzy retorts back, you know, I'm a modern woman and I'm working and I have a lot of friends uptown. And so in your book, funny, you don't look funny. Uh, you know, you talk about this concept of the M-A-A-W, the MA, the modern American Ashkenaz woman, um, as sort of like an evolution of the Jewish American princess, the Jap. So do you want to explain that term for us and kind of maybe contextualize Izzy in that for us? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, the... The concept of the Ma um, first came up to me when I was writing about the TV show Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. And um, because that show sort of lovingly declares its young Jewish protagonists to be Japs. And as I watched that show, I was like, OK, but they're not. And her mom like really is, but they don't name it that way. So I was like, we've got to we have to come up with a new way of describing young Jewish women that isn't Jap because it doesn't apply. Like the, the, right. the Jap has meaning and, and they don't fit it. Um, and Izzy absolutely would be a ma because the things about a Jap, right? Japs are uh, material, are not interested in intellectual pursuits and above all else, they're sexually frigid. Um, and Izzy is none of those things. Right. Like we see Izzy as being sexually adventurous. She loves the life of the mind. She, you know, she doesn't, she's not poor, but she's not living a, a pampered kind of existence. She's living in her rent controlled apartment. Um, so Izzy would, would 100% be one of those characters and those women that like, we need another way to talk about younger Jewish women that isn't that isn't a Jap because she is a hundred percent not a Jap. So yes, she would absolutely be a ma a modern Ashkenazi American woman. Yeah. What what's interesting is the way you were describing that Jap almost feels like the proposition that she gets from uh from Anton at the end when he invites her into the apartment and he's like, you know, I'll take care of you, I'll take care of you sexually. You can fill out this entire apartment, buy whatever you want, you'll design it. And right. she wholeheartedly rejects that. She's like, You completely misread who I am. That is and she like, and I think she reverts to this, you know, to this ma that you're describing. She says, "I, I recognize now that you know the light for me was more on that side than with the Sam than uh, yeah. than what you're offering to me." Yeah, absolutely. Uh, as a resident of Florida so. Coast, you know, I, I wanted to ask specifically about the Ashkenaz part. Did you not see, or do you not see, like modern examples of Sephardic women occupying a similar uh, space in television and film? 
Yeah, I, I mean, similar, certainly, but I really wanted to, I wanted to signal the fact that when we're talking about stereotypes of American Jews, it's really stereotypes of Ashkenazi Jews, uh-huh. um, because I think that far too often we shorthand, we just call things Jewish when we're, you know, describing American Jewish things, and yeah. and they they are not universally Jewish, you know, like the things we describe as Jewish foods are really Ashkenazi foods. Yeah. Um, and so I, I kind of wanted to leave space for the fact that there are other Jewish cultures ah, out there yeah. that are not necessarily mm-hmm. identical. And and so it's it's less that I don't see it in modern Sephardi or Mizrahi women and more that the stereotype is based on a cur- certain kind of American Jewish trope. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's really embedded in, in Ashkenaziism. Well, this seems like a great place to kind of like pause, take a break, have another pickle if we got them handy. We'll come back and Harry's going to introduce us to some of the people's categories, right? And uh, we'll kind of go through that and then we'll rate the film on a scale of one to five Jews, Jewish stars. Or maybe we could do one to five pickles. I don't know. <laughs> maybe. But uh, we'll be right back. Welcome back to Jews on Film. Harry, do you want to introduce some categories for us? Yeah, sure. So we're going to start off by trying to figure out what was the most Jewish scene of the film. And the scene certainly had explicitly Jewish people, Jewish characters. But what did you guys think when you were watching this was the most Jewish scene you'd point to and show someone who's a Jewish movie? I'll, I'll start with one, I guess, if okay. you guys want to think about it more. Sure. But I, uh, you know, one thing that I'll point to is I mentioned the Bubby in any scene that she's in, I kind of feel like there's a real Jewishness to it. And it could have been her talking to Hana and talking about matchmaking because that rings very true from some of the familiar Jewish tropes and honestly real life conversations that I've seen. But I really just wanted to shout out the scene where Bubby and Sam get drunk on schnapps and start dancing in some of the old classical dancing styles together where it was just, Love it. it was as a movie that I think thematically talks about tradition a lot. And there's mention to, you know, uh, you know, Sam going, we said going to shul and there's mention to, you know, the tradition of the pickles and their Jewish faith. I think that was the one scene that really spotlighted actual tradition and visually showed you these people mm-hmm. kind of reenacting dances that they're from different generations, different families. I mean, they just met each other, but they kind of have this shared history between the two of them. That was really cool and, and fun to kind of clap along to while I was watching that on screen. So I would say that dancing scene was my most Jewish scene in the movie. Did you have schnapps as well? When I was watching it, yes. Yeah. I tried to sync up with them. Every time oh, they took a shot, Great. I took some too, yeah. Mazda Tov. Yeah. I guess I'll cop out and say the bris scene. Oh. Um, because, you know, obviously, like, Fair. yeah, it's it's an actual circumcision. So there's the, you know, there's a rabbi. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm I'm picking that one in part because, as you say, it everything else in the movie is so ineffably Jewish to me. Like, there's just a Jewish soul that inhabits every scene of the movie that I would yep. be hard pressed to really articulate. Um, so the circumcision scene is it's much easier to to kind of wrap your wrap your hands around why that might be considered a Jewish scene. Um, but it like it's not just the presence of the rabbi or the fact that they're doing a circumcision. The reactions of all of the characters who are there, I also think run the absolute like gamut of Jewish personality types. Um, so that scene really brings together the like, okay, I can identify this as Jewish because there is a rabbi and he's performing a Jewish ritual. And it's got the ineffable Jewish stuff with it that I was talking about. So, so I think that that'll be my scene. Yeah. And I think that scene really packed a, a real authenticity to it. Like even that rabbi and you've seen, I've seen circumcision scenes in other movies that are kind of characterized and there's a big joke about what's going on. Yeah. But this felt like they brought a rabbi off the street. They're like, you just gave us circumcision the other day. Can you perform one for us on screen? I'd like to take a few moments to explain to you exactly what we're going to be doing here. Firstly, we're going to be circumcising this baby in accordance with the covenant signed by Abraham and God where God promised to make a great nation of a seed of Abraham. Even like you're saying, the reactions and the way people treated it, you know, they weren't, you know, making a joke out of it. It was, it, they took it seriously. It was very cool. Very right. authentic. I found. And like the, even down to the part where like the baby is lying there and, and starts to pee on the rabbi and it doesn't like, it's not a big thing. No, but you know, everybody right. doesn't start, right. ah, like right. it, 
just it's just the thing that happens because he's a baby. He's eight days old. He's gonna be, you know. Perfect. Um, it it's just part of life. Right. I love um, it. I'm sure, by the way, Carrie, I'm sure that's how the casting process went. You know, they just like went outside and they were like, Does Sometimes anyone... they do that. Sometimes you read those stories and it's like they just found the local rabbi and said, right. Come yeah. on in. I mean, yeah, it's a lot better, I think, you know, in terms of like uh, circumcision scenes, it's much better than your favorite film, Keeping the Faith, you know, where they're, <laughs> where they're you know, giving the baby the circumcision and the rabbi just like, I, he just like passes out having, yeah. maybe he had never seen them before as a rabbi. I don't, I don't know. know. Whatever. Um, but back to this movie, I think, you know, I might be kind of closer to Harry in terms of a Bubby scene. I think, you know, anything specifically in Bubby's kitchen, like the heart of the apartment. So I think, you know, one of these scenes, you know, where she's like feeding Sam and Izzy, I would say maybe like the introduction scene where we get a lot of like really good food in the foreground. We have Bubby over here. We have the matchmaker and then the matchmaker takes Bubby out of the room and Bubby like doesn't quite understand why she's being asked to leave. And then she leaves. Um, there's a lot of sprinkling of like good food, Jewish grandma, matchmaker, plus a little bit of Yiddish. Plus, like, the awkward setup, I think it makes, for me, like, probably one of the more Jewish scenes of the film. So that's going to be my pick. Yeah. So uh, the second category that I wanted to introduce here is uh, one of our favorites, and that's the stretch of the pond. So feel free to get creative, come up with something intended or not that, you know, you think was secretly a Jewish scene in this uh, already pretty Jewish film. Okay. So this I actually do have an answer to. In my soul, this movie is self-consciously referential and psychic so like one of the things i like about this movie is how many little subtle casting things fold in on each other and so like first off there is this little throwaway scene on izzy's birthday where her parents call from the retirement village where they live in florida to sing her happy birthday Uh and they have uh gotten the help of like three other dudes who live in the retirement village to barbershop them or ted it up with her dad right and so then there is this one of the guys who takes the solo line on happy birthday dear izzy happy birthday to you happy birthday to you happy birthday And I was watching the movie and my head shot up when he opened his mouth and I went, I know that warbly tenor. So I went to IMDb and of course they're just listed as birthday singer one, two, and three. So like I have to (laughs) figure out which one it is, but like I figure out he's birthday singer number one and I go to his past film credits and sure enough, all the way back in 1967, he was the tenor singing Hitler auditioning in The Producers. Whoa. The, yeah, I was like, I absolutely Too know wild. that voice. And wow. like, And so, like, to me, I want to believe that that is on purpose, that that is an Easter egg ah. that was thrown in there for us, that, like, we're going to throw out this guy who the only other thing he's really ever done was be a singing Hitler in The Producers 20 years ago, but let's pull him out. Um you know, if I want to think that the movie can also see into the future, I love the fact that Peter Riegert, if you're of a certain generation, you know him from Animal House. Uh-huh. But if you are a bit younger, you may well know him from his recent arc on The Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, where he ended up playing the love interest of Carol Kane, who was the star of Hester Street, which was Joan Mecklen Silver's other movie. Oh. So like that, those, those to me that like, I, I want to believe that these things are on purpose that, you know, she put those two together or that those two got put together in Unbreakable sure. Kimmy Schmidt because of the John Mecklen silver connection and that they cast, I don't even remember his name, Ruben, something Ruben, um, as the, the singer in this because of the producers, I, I want to believe. Wow. We've- Everything you said earlier about the casting and a lot of these Yiddish performers, like it, it all feels very intentional. Uh-huh. I 100% buy this. I think, you know, 50 points for the uh, stretch of the pod for that totally. one. Totally, 100%. That, yeah, no, that's there. I get it. And I love that producer's reference. I think next time we talk, we'll have to make sense out of why the producers, what are we saying about, you know, yeah. Hitler? And But wow, that's, uh, yeah, that's there. I'm, I'm buying this one. Tough fact to follow, Harry. What about you? 
Okay, so I, I was ready this week because oh, you know, okay. normally we go with these stretches and depending on the movie, I'll either dread it or really kind of relish getting to do it. Cause no pun intended. It's, it's no so pun intended. Pickle relish, sure. Uh-huh. Thank you, thank you, but, thank you. But there was something there that I'm actually going to argue was intentional. And there's a, there's a scene, and we'll link it in because I'm not going to quote it exactly here, but it's very early on and Izzy just says that she had this dream. I'm in the ocean and the water is a, a funny color, maybe pink or something maybe like something's bled there recently and i'm standing uh, i'm not floating not swimming i'm standing and the water levels up to here on me and then the next thing and I, I know it, it drops way down to here in my mind that immediately tells me it's the story of the exodus and it's specifically the story of the character of nachshon ben aminadav who for those who aren't familiar when the Jews were famously crossing, what sea was it? Oh, right, the Red Sea. And she said that the water's red. What happened was they were were surrounded by Egyptians at their back. They had a sea in front of them. And the story goes that Nachshon ben Aminadav is the first one to kind of take that leap of faith, have faith in God, and, you know, walks into the water. And I think what the rabbis tell us is that as soon as it got up to, it was either his chin or his nose or whatever it was where it got too deep, that's when the water immediately splits, which... To me, and again, hopefully when I find the quote, I'll listen back and it won't sound ridiculous. I'm pretty sure that's kind of exactly what's going on in her dream. So I tried to make sense of it. You know, is this because, is this her anxiety over being set up by a shadchan? Because she she wants to take the first move. She wants to, you know, be the first person out there. She Because she in the beginning, she's very resistant. And honestly, right. we didn't mention this, but she only really starts to come around on Sam when she finds out that, like, he doesn't normally get set up and that... He, you know, is a little bit more picky and a little bit more adventurous because I think she wanted some more agency. But the other leap of faith thing I was saying is, or maybe that's just the commitment to Sam is the let your guards down, have faith, go into the water and just go for it. So I think, I don't know if that that scene, that dream sequence or just the dream description we get has really any other significant plot payoff in the rest of the movie. But thematically, it definitely wired my brain to start thinking of that scene. And I think there is uh, an intentional biblical connection there. If we ever talk to you know anyone who worked on this film, we can maybe confirm or deny that theory. Beautiful. How's that, Daniel? I, oh, I love that one. I, I feel like um, you know my stretch is probably not such a you know not such a big deal. Um, <laughs> again, uh, nice. Uh, nice. Uh, um, you know, as a dad, I feel uh, obligated to make these terrible jokes. So apologies to the listener. Um, I feel like, you know, for me, it's just going to be a little bit more simplistic related to pickles. I just thought this idea of like Sam and his, uh, you know, taking over the business from his dad working in pickles, you know, with part of pickling is like preservation. So I feel like maybe Sam is like preserving the Jewish faith within the pickles, you know, maybe a little bit more symbolic, um, you know, it's all right. Maybe we could also add, you know. Jenny, as you were talking, you you did a two stretches, which is great. We love it. Extra, you know, extra helping. I was gonna go also talking about the brown hat. Maybe yeah. that's kind of like a, you know, like a black hat almost, but a little bit different. So, um, you know, something that people on the Lower East Side would wear, you know, more more religious Jews and things like that. Um, not my strongest uh, stretches, but I thought you know maybe I, I don't know. I think I, we went. I think we went three for three. I feel good about the, uh, okay. the stretches of the pod this week. Oh, good. Usually oh, you're not. Good. You know, my stretches are a little bit too left field. Sometimes you go off the rails, but I think you uh, you reined it in a little bit. And oh, I think great. we uh, we took over the kind of crazy out there theories, Jenny and I. So so that kind of freed you up to be the uh, voice of reason because the pickle preservation thing, like I buy it. I think that's okay. a great you know thematic. Right. Like he could have been in any industry. They chose pickles. It's a good one. Yeah, I mean. You know, thinking about this film and its legacy, uh, you know, do we feel like this film is good for the Jews? Oh, sure, yeah. All right, yeah. Harry. <laughs> no, I, I, I agree. I agree with that. I think you know, we always ask this question: Are you from the perspective of the person who's Jewish watching this, not Jewish? Honestly, both. I think it doesn't. It presents you know this faith. It, it doesn't you know demonize Sam for having his faith. It doesn't criticize Izzy for kind of her flirtatious relationship with it, and it celebrates Bubby. Like these are all great Jewish characters. They're good people. There's a Jewish you know culture and way of life about them, and. They all seem great. Like I said, this movie is not very judgmental. Definitely not of the Jewish characters. So right. I'd say yeah. great for the yeah. Jews. It, it resists basically every negative Jewish stereotype. You know, the yeah. assimilated Jews are still having a bris and the observant Jews can still like go uptown and go to a baseball Become, game and, yeah. you know, be well be, read. Yeah. Right. Be, you know, normal. So like, yeah, I think it's great. Nice. 
Um, yeah, I, I, I would agree with all of that. You know, I think, um, you know, the Jews come off looking very, very good uh, in terms of, you know, their commitment to faith, their, you know, but also I think what it does nicely is that there's not like one type of Jew in the film, you know, between Sam and between Bubby and between Izzy, there's three different Jews. And, you know, the, you know, Bubby is like the ultra traditional, Izzy's totally on the other side, like the ultra modern and Sam is kind of in the middle, um, kind of balancing the two, uh, you know, opposing forces. But I think overall it's a, it's a good showing for the Jews. So, um, Awesome. I would definitely that, suggest watching the film uh, for those who have not, you know, that's not apparent by this point of the podcast. We haven't really done our job, but hey, that brings us to our, uh, as we do on every episode to our final ranking. So what we're going to be doing is rating the scale, the film on a scale of one to five Jewish stars, Jewish pickles, whatever you want to call it, kosher, you know, kosher dill pickles, um, one to five, not a rating of the quality of the film so much as how Jewish was it keeping into consideration the cast and crew, the content of the film and some of the themes that we've discussed. So uh, Daniel, do you want to get us started just talking out where you would rate the film on a scale of one to five Jewish stars? Sure, sure. Um, so Joan Micklin Silver, I can assume, uh, you know, Susan Sandler, also Jewish. Um, Amy Irving has Jewish roots. Peter Rager, um is Jewish as well. Uh, Rizal Boisek, uh Jewish. Very, very pretty, you know, fairly Jewish cast, um, you know, in front of and behind the camera. A lot of themes discussed. Um you know, in terms of, you know, nice Jewish boys, nice Jewish men versus the Gentile, everything we covered, you know, I think it's all, it's all there. You know, it does a good job of balancing the Lower East Sideness and the um, heavily Jewish environment with the uptown of it all. So I think I'm going to come in strong uh, on this one, but I don't want to tease my rating just yet, unless you want me to, but maybe I'd like to hear from it all at the end. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, Jenny, how about yourself? Yeah, I, I mean, I I agree. The I I feel as I mentioned earlier, there's there's sort of this ineffable Jewish quality that I think suffuses most of the film. Um, I I am gonna, you know, again tease tease my rating a little bit to say that I I have slight issues with the the kind of Mrs. Maisel effect of mm. when you know who who are we casting as desirable jewish women um so that is yeah. that is going to impact my rating um but overall i i think there's there's something so jewish about so much of the film and it's handled with such nuance and sensitivity and and it's clear that it was made by people who know what they're doing i, w I wanted to jump back to what you just said can you say more a little bit about the miss Maisel effect because i've been thinking about the show as it you know, just recently finished um can you expand a little bit on that idea of like the casting? Yeah, I, I mean, there's just there's been a lot of discussion recently about the sort of what people call Jew face casting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, um, oh yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, We'd so, it. um, and you know, and it's but it's not a new phenomenon. Uh, it's right. just that we've had so many high profile examples of it recently, and it it does seem to happen more frequently when we're looking at um people who are supposed to be pretty women um so whether it's uh, you know mrs mrs Maisel or uh, there have been a lot Catherine Hahn gets cast as yeah. Jewish really frequently to Michelle Williams uh playing Steven Spielberg's mother in the yeah. Fablemans um yeah you know we just we see a lot of examples of um non-Jewish actors being cast in these in these Jewish roles um and it is a little more complicated with Amy Irving because her father, um, her father was Jewish, but uh, but you know she she is not. Mm, right. It says Irving's maternal great great. I was trying to do some research and I couldn't really parse out on Wikipedia. It says she was raised in Christian Science. Yeah, her mom's her Christian maternal Science. maternal great great grandfather was also Jewish. So it's kind of like, I don't know how to categorize this one, but yeah, definitely certainly an interesting discussion. So I wasn't sure I was, I had assumed that Amy Irving, you know, based on, you know, her relationship with Spielberg and like her casting in the film, I just you know, maybe had assumed, but this does come up on the podcast from time to time where someone who we assume is Jewish is not and how that impacts our rating. But go ahead, Harry. 
Yeah. 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 And I think, right, you could probably trace back her lineage to technical jury, but there is a difference when you, there, there are many actors that we've covered that we can point to that are kind of openly and, you know, proudly Jewish in a way that I think you, you'd hope for in roles when it really is about their Jewishness and about these questions in their family. Um, uh, in terms of my ranking on, on this movie, on terms of its Jewishness, I think one thing that we've been saying a lot is that this movie is like, has this Jewish, you know, ether to it, that it's, 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 is clearly like this Jewishness to the to the story of it. And it's it's the kind of thing that we've spoken about a lot. I think it's hard to point to everything explicitly. I mean, it's, you know, a lot of it is the New York, you know, bookishness. A lot of it is the relationships that we see and the way that kind of faith kind of hovers over and exists in their lives, even for, uh, you know, even, even for Izzy, where it's not, you know, the most present in everything she does, but it's clearly, you know, she's not rejecting that. She's clearly has that kind of relationship with her uh with her bubby and that that guides a lot of their sensibilities. So I think there there clearly is a Jewishness in that in watching the movie. You know, that was part of my they don't make them like they used to a kind of yeah. New York movie. Not quite about nothing in right, the Seinfeld right. sense, but just in a very low stakes like, you know, what's it like to just be on the Upper West Side and figure out your future, you know, or I don't know where she lives Upper West. I was just pointing to one area, but in Manhattan. Sure. But um so I think the movie really has a Jewish sensibility coupled with the fact that it has a lot of technical you know jewish representation and we spoke about the bris scene and the way that it honors it authentically and the way that you know it 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 doesn't shy away from any of the accents or any of the characters so i'm i'll start us off on the ranking now that we've all kind of set our piece and sure i think i'm going to go with a four out of five jewish stars and call this a, a pretty pretty jewish movie i would you could you definitely can't watch this and you can't write a you know a 10 word imdb summary without throwing the word jewish in there so i would give this pretty jewish so four out of five uh what do you guys think about it yeah, I, I was also going to go with four out of five. And I will say, I think you're right about the Upper West Side because the scene where she is in the little restaurant and the woman comes in singing Some Enchanted Evening, that's in oh, Green yeah. Papaya. Oh. That's Green Papaya, which is on the Upper West Side. It's awesome. Um, Love yeah, it. So four out of five Jewish star shaped pickles for me. Oh, okay. I agree. <laughs> I'm going to awesome. cut my pickles that way now. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah. I think I might go a little bit higher in that, like, you know, thinking about everything. Um, I might go like four and a half just because I thought it was like such a good balance of, you know, of putting the, the Jewishness in contrast with the New York of the eighties and the bookstore culture and uptown and everything. And, and just kind of not having it be like too much, but just the right amount. And yeah, I, I dug it. Um, I will ding some points, you know, for Amy Irving's, uh, you know, not being technically Jewish uh, or whatever, having whatever. Maybe I'll just say I'll give it four and a half stars. I don't want to, you know. Um, yeah, but I, I did really enjoy the the film quite a bit. Dr. Jenny Kaplan, thank you so much for, for being here on Jews on Film today. Um, I wanted to see if you could uh, take a moment and talk to folks about your new book, Funny You Don't Look Funny, uh, and tell people maybe where they could check it out. Yeah, I am always glad to talk about that. Um, so as the subtitle of the book says, it's Judaism and humor from the silent generation to millennials. Um, so the book basically looks at the way that four generations of Jewish comedians. So that's the silent generation. Those are folks who were mostly born in between the two world wars. Um, the baby boomers who were born from the end of World War One, uh, World War Two, into the 1960s. Uh, Gen X, who were basically the um, mid 60s to the end of the 70s, 1980, uh, and then millennials, how they express their changing relationship to Jewish identity and Judaism through their comedy. And basically what I show is that the silent generation, um, so these are the folks who are making humor in like the 1960s, 1970s, um, that they were hostile to institutions. They had that whole hippie counterculture thing going. They didn't trust organized religion, but they also lived through World War II. So they're very protective of the idea of Jews as people, as a category. They 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 didn't really go in so much for mocking Jews for existing, um, but they were more than happy to mock rabbis, mock ritual, whatever. Um, and then by the time you get to Gen X, it, the pendulum swings the other way. And when you look at Gen X comedy from the like the 2000s, 2010s, um, what you see is people who are fine with making fun of Jews as Jews for existing. That like like Jews, am I right? 
Um, but you also find all of these examples where they really take ritual very seriously and, and they use ritual as a thing that humanizes their characters um, and, and that ritual and tradition has value because it unites families and it gives people depth. Um, so that, that's what I chart over the course of the book. And then when we look at millennials, you know, millennials are just now kind of starting to dominate comedy um, because they're mostly in their 20s and 30s. The oldest millennials are about 40 right now. So they're still the, yeah, they're still the rising. Um, and, and I'm an ex I'm, I'm right on the, I'm right on the okay. cusp. Um, so, you know, they're, they're just rising to take over the industry. So we don't have enough data really to show what, um, what the trend is going to be for millennials. But for right now, millennials are willing and nothing is sacred for them. They're sort of willing to take on anything. Um, and, and that I think also is indicative of where they, how comfortable they've become as Americans and, and sort of how they feel about the relationship between their Jewishness and their Americanness that, that there, there doesn't need to be a separation between the two. Awesome. Um, and in terms of where you can get it, uh, you can buy it, uh, at any of your fine online retailers. Um, I like to plug bookshop.org. Um, which is an online book retailer, but it will source them through your local independent bookstore for wherever you live. So um, you can you can find it most places, but I, I like to plug bookshop.org for that. Nice. And where can people find you online uh, if they wanted to kind of keep up with what you've got going on? You can you can find me on, on the socials, as the kids say. Um, I also have a website that's drjenniferkaplan.com. Um, so you can, you can find me any of those places. I'm, I'm at Jenny Kaplan on Twitter. Um, I'm at Jewish humor prof on Instagram. Um, so you can find me around. Awesome. I like this idea that I'm taking over the industry. Sounds cool. All right. One podcast at a time. Yeah. Love it. <laughs> now is uh, your moment. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Harry, anything from you to plug? No, just that. That sounds awesome. I cannot wait to read the book. Thanks again for being here, Jenny. Um, and thanks everyone for listening to Jews on Film. Make sure to follow us on all the social medias, on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, whatever your platform of choice. Have a good one and Shabbat Shalom. Thanks. Jews on Film is hosted and produced by Harry Ottensasser and Daniel Zana. Harry edited this episode. Follow us on Instagram at Jews on Film and subscribe to our podcast to get new episodes. Thanks for listening. Bye.